Um, it's a real honor for me to have this opportunity to join you um, for tonight's session of your national conference and the first national conference to be carried out virtually. Um, so far, it seems it's going very well. Um, and it's an opportunity for me to offer a few perspectives from my vantage point as someone who's recently returned to live in the United States um, after having lived and worked uh, for a period of time in Japan. And although I didn't have the same opportunity that you experienced um, in the Japan exchange and teaching program, now that I've returned uh, to the US um, this past August to live, um, I certainly think of myself as a Japan alumna. So as a recent returnee, I thought I might raise some of the contemporary issues that I had either observed um, in Japan or issues over which um, my staff at the Consulate General and I um, were engaging our uh, official and personal uh, contacts um, in Japan during my most recent assignment. Um, I should say that my remarks tonight and the issues I hope to discuss are no, by no means intended to be exhaustive or authoritative. Um, this is my accounting of some of the issues that um, stuck in my mind, if you will, um, that were frequently raised as topics of discussion or themes of events to which I um, took part, in which I took part over the three years of my assignment as the Consul General in Osaka. And from the outset, I should offer uh, the required disclaimers that um, my remarks tonight are not meant to represent uh, US official uh, government policy. And while I had uh, the honor of serving as the Consul General in Osaka um, from August uh, 2017 um, through this past August 2020, I should also emphasize that I no longer occupy that position, sadly. And uh, so my views should not be misconstrued as official viewpoints or as the policy of the US mission in Japan. So I'd like to start out, if I can, with a short um, summary of my own uh, diplomatic career. I joined um, our diplomatic service in January of 1989. Um, and which means that at the end of January 2021, I will be celebrating 32 years as a US diplomat. And like many of my peers at that time who started their careers with the Department of State's diplomatic service, I joined after having worked for several years in other occupations. In my case, I had served as a volunteer English teacher with the Peace Corps in Senegal in West Africa, and after having been employed by two different private sector companies in the Washington DC area. And this is very different, um, I would note, from my Japanese counterparts um, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, most of whom um, entered Japan's diplomatic service directly after completing uh, undergraduate studies. So over the nearly 32 years of my career as a diplomat, I had the great fortune to serve in Japan on three earlier assignments before this latest assignment that I've completed as Consul General in Osaka. I also worked in the US embassies in Cameroon, West Africa, in Manila in the Republic of the Philippines and in Harare, Zimbabwe in South Africa. In addition to serving at our State Department headquarters in Washington, DC. And there was one additional uh, domestic assignment that gave me the opportunity to live and work in Honolulu, Hawaii, when I was assigned as a special staff member to the commander of the U uh, US Indo-Pacific Command. And that was very sweet. In spite of multiple challenges of uh, moving overseas with school-aged children, adjusting to different environments in our home, their schools, and my workplace, I really enjoyed my career as a representative of the U.S. government and the American people. And I especially enjoyed living and working in other countries, learning about the realities of life in these places, 
meeting people and exchanging views with them. For most of my career, my two sons traveled with me on my overseas assignments and attended international schools outside of the United States. But from about 2011, both of them began living full-time in the United States to study and to pursue their careers. They both fondly remember their childhood experiences, especially the times that they recall living in Japan. And I'm very happy that I could share those international travels with them. I would note that neither of them have taken the option to become uh, or pursue a career in diplomacy. And as a mom, I'm a little bit disappointed in that. Um, so this issue of working as a professional who's also a mother brings me to one of the issues that was a recurrent topic of discussion during this most recent stay in Japan. And that um, being of workplace diversity and women's empowerment. In the context of ongoing public and private concerns over the country's lagging economic growth and the rise of China as a regional and global economic presence, uh, these discussions usually focused on expanding the presence of women in Japan's workplace, not only at the working level, but also at uh, senior managerial levels on the need to increase um, opportunities for women and, girl in, women and girls in the STEM field, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and on looking at economic and social changes to achieve gender equality and to close gender parity gaps. And I can't help but contrast these most recent discussions um, that I took part in with those that I recall from 30 years earlier during my first assignment in Japan. In the early 90s, the workplace discussions um, involving women um, that I participate, participated in were very much focused on women's rights and the women's movement. In these more recent times, however, the workplace diversity and women's empowerment discussions seem firmly centered on supporting Japan's regional and global competitiveness with audiences um, that included um, middle and senior business managers um, who were decidedly more interested in engaging in these talks um, than I recall their counterparts having been uh, 30 years earlier. Over the past several years, as you know, increasing numbers of Japanese women are joining the workplace and those who are already in the workplace are seeking greater opportunities to expand their responsibilities within the organizations and the businesses where they are working. Whenever I traveled across the 17 prefectures that uh, made up my consular district in Western Japan, I had the opportunity to meet with prefectural governors and mayors and local town officials. Um, I frequently ran into uh, JET participants who were ALTs in some of those offices, which was always fun. Uh, and during most of those meetings, um, I would ask about the challenges that these officials were managing and invariably the issue of low birth rate and the rapidly aging population would be part of the response that I would, I would receive. Local officials bemoaning the departures of young residents for academic study in Tokyo or in Osaka um, because they knew that very few of those departing students would return to live and work in their rural townships. I also heard about matchmaking plans to encourage marriages among young residents and schemes to compensate young families to encourage multiple births that they hoped would boost the local population. Unfortunately, it seems that none of these plans are working very successfully. And in 2019, Japan's health ministry announced that the number of babies born that year had fallen by an estimated almost 6% to 864,000 births. And this was the first time since 1899, apparently, when the government began tracking the data that the number 
had dipped below 900,000 births. In addition to the impact of this phenomenon on Japan's economic performance, there's also the increasing social security burdens of the rapidly aging society. Most of this burden is still shouldered by Japanese women who do the housework and the childcare and who live in a culture that still makes it difficult um, to both have a job outside of the home and to be a mother. So of course, as a working mother, I was an, uh, an, an, an element of uh, much uh, curiosity and questioning. And I had an opportunity, several opportunities to talk about the reality, uh, my reality coming from the United States as a working professional and a mother. And I would always um, hasten to tell them that um, the United States is, um, is, is, is perhaps in a different place than Japan, but certainly it's no paradise um, for working uh, mothers um, as um, paid leave is uh, still a pipe dream for most uh, American women. One outcome of the situation in Japan is that younger generations of Japanese women have increasingly opted to continue working, um, placing it, giving it a higher priority over marriage and leaving careers uh, to raise children. Uh, so is immigration part of the solution? And there were lots of discussions that um, I was a part of um, that touched on the immigration issue. Um, since Japan's population has declined every year since 2007, and while other countries have countered declining birth rates by permitting immigration, Japan has been slow to allow foreigners to settle. According to some estimates, uh, now there are nearly 3 million migrants who live in Japan out of a population of 126 million. And I would just point out that that figure of 3 million is about triple the figure um, that it was when I first arrived in Japan in 1990. And as the country faces the challenges of its rapidly aging population, its um, shrinking domestic workforce, it is looking to further increase uh, the number of migrants. Um, in April of uh, last year, the government in, in implemented historic immigration reform. It expanded uh, visa programs to allow more than 354,000 new workers to immigrate to Japan over a subsequent five-year period. The growth in immigration is changing uh, the image of Japan from ethnically homogeneous to moderately diverse. And this growth is not only occurring in Tokyo, where you would expect, but it's also taking place in small industrial towns around the country as well. And while immigration has become a hot button political issue in the United States and in parts of Europe, I think it's notable that Japan's immigration shift has not sparked similar public reactions or backlash. One other item that I would bring up um, as a contemporary issue would be social justice and um, the issue of uh, social justice protests that also occurred in Japan. The images of George Floyd's death um, earlier this year at the hands of the Minneapolis police officers sparked protests outside of the US, um, most notably in several European and African uh, capitals. Several cities in Japan, including in Tokyo, Osaka, Kyoto, Hiroshima, and Okinawa also organized peaceful rallies to protest Floyd's killing and denounce police brutality. At our US embassy and in our consulates around Japan, our public affairs sections organized virtual discussion that garnered some of the largest audiences we have ever attracted and certainly the largest online audiences. Japanese participants wanted to express their appreciation for these opportunities to better understand 
the social justice movement in America. But these events also provided opportunities to examine issues of racial attitudes as it impacts mixed race Japanese, Chinese and Korean residents in Japan. In June of this year, NHK television aired a segment that attempted to explain to Japanese viewers what was happening in the US but the report featured animated video with stereotypical caricatured images of African-Americans that were highly offensive. To its credit, NHK apologized in response to critical reactions from its viewership. And it subsequently hosted an in-house discussion session for its entire programming staff. And that led to on-air primetime programming that explored racial issues. In contemporary Japan, where Ariana, Ariana Miyamoto was crowned Miss Japan in 2015, but berated online in online comments as unfit to represent the country, where images of tennis champion Naomi Osaka were altered to depict her with lighter skin for an advertising campaign, and comedians joked that she should get some bleach to change her skin color. And where Vogue model Rina Fukushi, TV personality David Yano, and other bi biracial Japanese live in the public eye, but still struggle with identity labels such as hafu, mikusu, or daburu, the discussion and the focus on raising public awareness of negative racial attitudes in Japan might be considered overdue. I would also want to cite um, the impact of climate and environmental changes in Japan as a factor for Japan watchers around the world and in Japan to keep an eye on, as there is an increase in the likelihood of more and, in, and more intense and more frequent extreme weather events, in addition to the ever present threat of earthquakes in seismically active Japan. And I would note that I, in 2011, um, with the uh, earthquake um, event in, in Tohoku, I was um, working in Japan at that time in our embassy in Tokyo and had my mother uh, living with me in Tokyo and my son going, my youngest son going to school in uh, Yokohama. Um, and that experience really um, altered our way of thinking of, about earthquakes, certainly. Indeed, in the three years that I've spent uh, most recently in Western Japan, uh, most years were marked by several severe weather events, including torrential rainstorms that flooded large swaths of several prefectures and caused mudslides that killed over 200 people, along with a heat wave that also added to the death count. The combination of Japan's aging society and climate change has contributed to deadly impact of floods on elderly and nursing home residents in Japan. The COVID-19 pandemic is also a particular threat to vulnerable aging, to the vulnerable aging population in Japan. With 121,241 cases of COVID-19 in Japan, and I checked that number today, and um, 1,845 deaths nationwide to date, Japan is in a far more enviable state of affairs than we currently find ourselves in in the United States, um, for sure. As in the US, uh, the pandemic um, has, uh, in Japan has triggered an economic recession, including the postponement of the 2020 Tokyo Olympic Games, in addition to severe ramifications for Japan's health sector and hospitals. And with cases of the virus rising as it was predicted it would during the winter flu season, uh, Japanese government officials are watching the impact on the country's recent economic recovery and prompting Prime Minister um, Suga to call for a third extra budget. Uh, government measures like uh, the go-to travel campaign of subsidies has helped to boost consumption, 
But as the virus spreads again, companies are cutting back on hiring. And once these government measures expire, um, low wages are expected to again suppress uh, consumption in the economy. My three years in Japan um, that ended in August uh, this year are likely the last that I will spend in Japan as a US government diplomat. It was a privilege to represent the United States in Japan and I was exceptionally fortunate to have the honor of over four separate tours of duty and a cumulative 18 years of my career spent focused on Japan and Japan issues. Now that Japan is in my rear view mirror, uh, so to speak, the challenge for a Japan alumna like me is to figure out how to maintain my connections to Japan. The many professional contacts and friendships that I made there will be helpful, of course, and having access to a wealth of information that's available online will also keep me plugged in. But in addition to those connections, I have also sought out connections to Japan affinity groups and Asia related associations such as the US Japan Council, the Asia Society and the Japan uh, Society branch in California. Looking back in the rearview mirror, I will have uh, the opportunity now that I'm in the US to assess how my time in Japan has impacted me in many positive ways. Looking ahead, I'm very encouraged by the welcome news we received this week of developments by Pfizer and Moderna of their COVID vaccines. I very much hope to see the day come soon when it will be possible for international travelers to visit Japan again. I'm particularly looking forward to a possible attending of the Seto Uchi Art Triennale in 2022 and in 2025, the World Expo event in Osaka. Thank you, I'll stop my comments there and I'd be happy to respond to any questions that you may have. Thanks.